so real quick, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Michael Petak. Uh, I typically just, just go by Petak. Uh, I work in our Mountain West division, uh, managing our AmeriCorps programming amongst uh, a few other things. And uh, yeah, with me here is uh, one, of my, one of my colleagues. So. Hi, I'm Sam Newman. I'm a crew leader here at the Mountain West Division. I'm on PTAC. I am a leading affairs volunteer educator. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start off by talking about what about Leave No Trace, the organization. So what is Leave No Trace? Um, yeah, so Leave No Trace is a national movement run by a nonprofit organization called the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics. And it's dedicated to protecting the outdoors by teaching and by teaching and inspiring other people to enjoy it responsibly. So the center accomplishes this by delivering cutting edge education and training programs to millions of people across the country every year. And it's worth noting that a lot of the methods um, and guidelines proposed by the center are backed by research and data driven studies that are um, that they find from academic institutions or they help fund themselves. So why is Leave No Trace important? Uh, nine out of 10 people who visit the outdoors are not informed about Leave No Trace practices. And with an estimated 13 billion trips into the outdoors in the US alone every year, people are causing a lot of preventable damage. And that damage is starting to add up. Um, oftentimes we hear the expression, um, we're loving our public lands to death. Um, and that's sort of the aggregate impact of a renewed or increasing interest in our outdoor spaces. So some interesting um, statistics and facts. Um, for instance, trash lasts a very long time. Plastic grocery bags can last up to 20 years before degrading. Aluminum cans up to 100 and fishing line up to 600 years. Americans pay $3 billion annually to fight fires in parks and forests, and 80% of those fires are caused by humans. Um, wildlife in our parks are routinely re relocated and in some cases euthanized due to conflicts with humans, and a lot of this is a result of improper waste storage and also improper food storage. Um, the National Park Service cites human garbage as the origin of many of these unfortunate incidents. And Invasive species are being spread nationwide, um, as many ACERs probably know from our work. Um, and this, a lot of this is due to the moving of firewood from one area to the next by campers. There are a lot of infestations of non-native tree killing insects and disease that are often first found in campgrounds. Um, this isn't unique to firewood, it's also unique to aquatic fish species. Um, in Glen Canyon, for instance, or Lake Powell, the zebra mussel is starting to proliferate in these rivers um, as an aquatic hitchhiker. So just looking at public land use, um, I believe this is from 2015, but these are annual visitors to different systems. The state park system sees the most visitors each year, um, followed by the US Army Corps of Engineers, which is usually in Surprising one, but they manage reservoirs and um, other water resources. So it's great that a lot of people are spending a lot of time outside, but it also means there are more and more opportunities to impact the outdoors. Um, recreation related impacts to public lands are individual, but they are cumulative over time. Um, when 100 people leave a trail um, to take a photo of a nice vista, it's usually not that person who causes the impact, but it's the hundreds of others that follow in aggregate that, that create damage. So um, what can we do to prevent this sort of thing? Uh, the Leave No Trace Center encourages training and also educational resources with several different ways of reaching the public. We're going to go over three of them. Um, so there's the awareness workshop, like the one that you're attending right now. Um, and this is the first and least intensive. It lasts 30 minutes to a full day and offers introductory leave no trace concepts designed for the general public. Millions have attended awareness workshops and they continue to be a popular way to get trained. Um, in the document that we've shared in the chat, there's a link to an online awareness workshop that 
you can take as well if you're interested. The next option is a two-day trainer course, and that's taught in the field by a Leave No Trace Master Educator. The trainer course results in a certificate of completion, and trainers are able to hold their own awareness workshops and assist in other trainer courses. Currently, there are about 50,000 Leave No Trace trainers worldwide. Here at Mountain West, PTAC and myself have trained 12 new trainers. We held our first trainer course last November, and we're looking forward to training more as soon as conditions allow. And then finally, there's the comprehensive Leave No Trace Master Educator course, which is a five-day field-based training designed specifically for educators or those interested in teaching Leave No Trace. And there are currently about 11,000 of us in the US and abroad. So I want to talk a little bit about the seven principles of Leave No Trace. Research shows that Leave No Trace education is successful in improving people's knowledge about minimum impact practices, fostering an outdoor ethic, and positively influencing responsible behavior in the outdoors. And research indicates that education fosters a healthier, thriving wildlife and fewer negative interactions with humans, considerable litter reduction, less degradation of native plants and animal species, and stronger human bonds to the outdoors and a greater sense of stewardship. And the center continues to study and test their principles. As uh, Sam mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, center has done a lot of research, funds a lot of research, and partners with a lot of organizations in order to uh, continue improving their practices and uh, the advice that they're giving out through their educational programming. Uh, there's also a really important thing to consider when we talk about Leave No Trace and these seven principles, and that's the language that's used by the center. All of that language is used very intentionally. So when we think of these principles, we want to think of them as guidelines, and we want to remember that these are not rules, these are not laws. Uh, the center doesn't have a law enforcement division out there fining people for violating their principles. Uh, these are things that we want to keep in mind and considerations that we want to carry with us into the outdoors. Uh, but we may find a, ourselves in certain instances where we have to uh, compromise in order to remain safe or deal with an emergency situation. We may have to compromise on a principle uh, in order to help stick to another principle. Um, and so we want to keep that language in mind as we discuss these and as we recreate outdoors. And remember uh, that all of these are, are really great guidelines, but at, at the end of the day, uh, there's going to be instances where you have to take a few minutes to uh, consider these principles in real time in the field and make a judgment call as to what feels best for you. We also want to consider that Leave No Trace exists on a spectrum. We want to talk about a spectrum of impacts that we're having when we're recreating outdoors. So um, with those impacts, uh, we would like to uh, just keep in mind that the reason that they're saying Leave No Trace is to set that uh, bar high uh, in order to uh, get ourselves down to this fewer impact side of the spectrum here. Uh, originally, the center used the wording minimum impact practices and minimal impact camping, and they moved away from that language and adopted the leave no trace uh, wordage in order to set that bar, bar a little bit higher. Um, and we all recognize that, that leaving zero trace whatsoever is uh, just about impossible, um, especially in the, the modern context. But if that's our goal, then whatever we do leave behind is going to be significantly reduced. So our first principle, plan ahead and prepare. Plan ahead and prepare uh, is in many ways one of the, the most important, if not the most important principles. Because by following this one uh, closely, we ensure that we can follow all of the others as appropriate and to the best of our ability. Uh, so that said, part of planning ahead and preparing that's extremely important is knowing regulations and special concerns for areas you'll visit. And to lead those visitors, uh, lead other visitors by example. This is really important for us in the work context. When we're out on public lands and we're out in these places and we're wearing a uniform, 
people look to us as uh, people who are in a place of authority uh, while we're in the outdoors. And so we want to make sure that we're uh, leading by example and providing a positive model for other visitors to follow. We also want to make sure that we prepare for extreme weather hazards and emergencies and that we have a very well communicated uh, evacuation and emergency response plan. This is extremely important for those of us uh, in the workplace and working out in the field. We want to make sure that everyone on any crew that we have or uh, any employee that we have that they're familiar with what that plan is uh, so that we can help ourselves and uh, get ourselves out of those situations without uh, necessarily using other resources unless we absolutely have to. Obviously, safety and emergencies, uh, you know, trump the, the leave no trace principles for the sake of safety and health. And we also want to think about the little things that we can do. One thing that I really encourage folks to do is to carry one or two grocery bags with you into the outdoors. Uh, just making sure that you have stuff like that before you head out can uh, make, help you make sure that you're prepared uh, to pick up any litter that you find and do so in a safe and sanitary manner um, and in a manner that makes it easier to carry out. And again, that's another part of uh, leading other visitors by example. Folks will see you doing things like that and are generally very appreciative and uh, oftentimes will start doing things like that themselves. Uh, after having that example provided to them. Our second principle, travel and camp on durable surfaces. Uh, durable surfaces include established trails and campsites, rock, gravel, dry grasses, or snow. We want to remember that good campsites are found, not made, and altering a site is not necessary. And we want to protect riparian areas and other sensitive areas uh, by camping at least 200 to feet away from lakes and streams. 200 feet is 70 to 80 paces for the average adult. So if you ever have any question of whether or not you're far enough, you can take about 70 steps in a straight line. If you're zigzagging, obviously it doesn't uh, work as well, but you can just count out those paces to make sure you're far enough away. Uh, in the outdoor workplace, we want to make sure uh, that we are concentrating our use on those existing trails and on uh, durable surfaces as much as possible, especially considering how often we're required to go off trail for the work that we're doing. We want to avoid places where impacts are just beginning uh, and choose uh, durable surfaces or previously heavily impacted sites to uh, stage our work day. And we want to uh, naturalize and rehabilitate those areas after we're done with our projects. At the campsite, we also want to be mindful of a few things. Uh, it only takes a few nights of camping to severely impact vegetation. So that said, we want to make sure we're looking for those more durable surfaces. And those include things like grasses. With grasses, especially dry grasses, where the majority of uh, their living structure is down within the roots, they will be able to regrow seasonally if you camp on them um, versus a woody plant that could potentially get broken. Uh, and take longer to come back on top of just being uncomfortable. And we want to make sure that we're keeping our campsites small uh, and making sure that we're not um, expanding our camp as we go throughout a, a hitch cycle or throughout the duration of a, a project, uh, just ensuring that we're keeping that impact as small an area as we realistically can. Our third principle, dispose of waste properly. Pack it in, pack it out, inspect your campsite. Again, this is another really important uh, reason that we want to make sure that we're carrying in bags, uh, whether they be trash bags, grocery bags, etc. We want to coordinate with our project partner and land managers on what the most sustainable choice of crew restroom facilities is, especially for our crew program where we oftentimes have eight people camping in a, a spot for eight days at a time. And uh, those facilities can be a number of different things, groovers, porta potties, trenches, uh, wag bags. Uh, it all just depends on, on the place we're going. So we want to make sure that we're having that conversation before we go there. And the same is true of your outdoor recreation on your own time. You should always look up those uh, concerns and regulations for the area that you're going to 
before you go. A really good example of this is the typical rule for uh, pat holes is that you dig them six to eight inches deep, again, 200 feet from water, camp, or trails. However, there are some exceptions to the six to eight inch rule. For example, in desert environments, uh, you wanna bury human waste only four to six inches out and on south facing slopes whenever possible. In the soils that are found in many desert environments, there's very little biological activity. So UV light will actually degrade human waste faster than the biological activity of those soils. And UV light uh, does have a high penetration factor and is able to reach four to six inches down through uh, those loose arid soils. We also wanna make sure that we're packing out toilet paper and all hygiene products. This is done for a number of reasons. Uh, these products can contain a lot of pathogens through our waste and those pathogens can be introduced to soils. Uh, wildlife will also often dig these up and eat them and carry them around, um, which can also cause illness uh, in wildlife populations. So we wanna make sure that we're packing out any toilet paper that we use or uh, any single use feminine hygiene products. Uh, these um, can be unsightly. I know I don't particularly enjoy carrying out my toilet paper, uh, but a really good tip for doing that is to have a Ziploc bag and cover the outside of it in duct tape. It makes it more durable, it makes it less unsightly, and it helps with odor protection so it doesn't make everything else in your pack smell. Um, you can also attach it to the outside of your pack. Uh, but again, anything like that, we want to make sure that we're carrying out um, and packing out with us so we don't introduce uh, those nasty pathogens to anything that otherwise wouldn't come in contact with them. We want to wash ourselves in our dishes, again, 200 feet away from lakes or streams, even biodegradable soaps uh, and things that are advertised as being uh, much more friendly do oftentimes uh, cause some degree of damage to waterways. So we want to make sure that we're using a minimal amount and introducing as few of those chemicals into our soils and waters as we can. We also want to scatter our strained dish water. And typically when we do group dishes, we encourage our folks to uh, strain that dish water on a previously disturbed surface. And this is done for, for a number of reasons. Um, but the biggest one is that if we put it onto plants or anything like that, animals that have salt poor diets will find that and smell the food particulates still present in uh, that dishwater. And then they will uh, lick and eat and forage on all of that vegetation that they otherwise may not have. And we can severely damage uh, plants indirectly by introducing that, that food waste onto them. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we are putting it on a previously disturbed surface and where those aren't present, uh, again, we want to defer back to principle number two with durable surfaces and instead uh, put that dishwater on things like rocks that are less uh, susceptible to damage from uh, foraging animals. And another quick tip is separating trash from recycling uh, as appropriate for your local facilities. Again, every single principle ties back to the first one. And Knowing what can and cannot be recycled by your local facility is extremely important. Any recycling that cannot be recycled by that facility uh, ends up in the trash and the many facilities they end up dumping the entire load if they see too much non-recyclable content uh, in a load. So we want to make sure that we're aware of what our local facilities can handle and then consider uh, bringing maybe two different colors of trash bags so that you can separate those things in the field and do a lot less of that gross work when you get back. Um, it's already done for you just by being proactive and thinking of it beforehand. With that, I'll turn it over to Sam for a few more of our principles here. So leave what you find is usually one of the harder ones to follow. And I think it's a trickier one to explain to our members. Um, I was asking my members on my last hitch, which I just returned from, how many of them have ever taken something from an outdoor space that they were visiting? And every single one of them raised their hands. This is something that I'm also guilty of. I think it's a very human instinct 
to want to tie yourself to some place that was special to you by removing something from that and keeping that as a memento. But however, we want to preserve the past. We want to examine and not damage or touch cultural or historic structures or artifacts. Um, number one, removing items from their context damages the historical record. And so researchers who are coming there later have a less complete picture of what happened there um, based when items have been removed. Um, it also deprives future visitors of the experience to enjoy seeing something ancient or part of that place that you enjoyed and sort of motivated you to, I think, grab or take that object. Um, another reason we want to do that is a lot of items that are natural are part of a closed system in that ecosystem. For instance, in Sequoia Kings Canyon, um, a lot of folks will take sugar pine cones, which are much larger pine cones, but allowing those to land on the ground and then um, decompose over the time, decompose over time, uh, recycles nutrients back to those trees and is an important part of that ecosystem. Um, we also want to avoid introducing or transporting non-native species. Here in the Southwest, cheatgrass is a particularly bad invasive. Um, in fact, the U.S. spends more than $130 billion annually just on the treatment of invasive plant species. Um, so minimizing what we're doing during the workday to avoid transporting invasives is important. And this could include using a boot brush at the end of a project to remove any seeds, washing your clothing, and then doing cursory inspections on all of your gear. Um, oftentimes when I return home from Hitch, I notice a few plant hitchhikers attached to my pack or my shoes or anything else. And then we also want to avoid building structures, furniture, or digging anything in, uh, in places that we're visiting. I think rock carams are something that we see a lot in places where they don't belong um, and when they're not used for marking trails. And a lot of people go outdoors to get away from human society and experience solitude. Building a cairn can sort of ruin that experience for people because it's a marker that someone's been there before. Uh, moving on, our next one is minimize campfire impacts. 83% um, of wildfires are human caused, and many of these are from campfires getting out of hand or not being properly put out. Um, in Arizona in the last two years, of Tonto National Forest's 2.9 million acres, about 14% of that has burned in the last two years into fires, the Woodbury Fire and the Superstition Wilderness in 2019 and this year's bushfire, which in total burned, I believe, more than 400,000 acres. Um, this is, you know, I think there are probably going to be shifting attitudes towards having campfires, especially um, with global warming and uh, fuels in forests drying out faster and having longer fire seasons. We might see in wilderness areas fires being banned altogether. Um, so why do we want to have campfires? I, I think a lot of us probably have a lot of important memories gathered around campfires with friends or family. Um, so instead of having campfires, I think we can think about ways to sort of recreate these experiences, social gathering and warmth, while minimizing the potentially catastrophic effects of campfires getting out of control. And this may sound silly, but in PTAC and I's Leave No Trace trainer course, instead of having a fire, we just turned our headlamps on, threw them into a circle, and then just talked around that for a while. Um, while not providing warmth, it did sort of provide the venue for, I think, a lot of socializing and, and, and talking. But if you are going to have a fire, try to have it in an established fire ring. Um, and then if you're collecting firewood, we want to follow the three Ds, which are dead, down, and dinky. So you want to collect dead wood and not strip it from live trees. You want to make sure that the wood you're gathering is on the ground. And you want to make sure it's dinky. And that just means that it is about smaller than your wrist. And then if you're transporting firewood, we want to make sure that it's locally sourced, um, bringing in any insect hitchhikers like bark beetles can damage trees in an area, which over time makes these forests more susceptible to fires because the trees are already weakened. Our next principle is to respect wildlife. Um, so something that I teach to my members 
is to follow the wildlife rule of thumb. And it's hard to demonstrate without video, but just sticking your thumb out and closing one eye and then trying to cover whatever wildlife you're looking at. And if your thumb completely covers the animal, then you're at a safe distance. Um, but we also want to avoid engaging with animals directly besides observation, um, never feeding them. Feeding them damages their health. It alters their natural behaviors and exposes them to predators and other dangers. Um, when I was working in Bryce Canyon last year, they had a rattlesnake that was hanging around one of the park benches. And the reason it was doing that was because visitors were sitting at the bench feeding chipmunks um, their snacks. So the rattlesnake started hanging out there because it figured out that there was easy prey to be had around there, which endangered the chipmunks unnecessarily, the rattlesnake, because it was a threat to people and also the people who were there um, feeding the animals. So another way to do that is just to protect wildlife and your food by storing your rations in trash securely. Um, and that might be bear hangs, bear canisters, and then for those mini bears, like squirrels, raccoons, or whatever else you have, um, putting things in rat hangs or keeping your food in your car when you're car camping. On Hitch, um, if we're in bear country, we'll store all of our items in our trailers and then lock the trailers at night. And then all of our smelly items, like toothbrushes, sunscreen, lotion, anything like that just goes into the vehicle which we lock each night. And then we also want to avoid wildlife during sensitive times. So mating, nesting, raising young, or winter. And finally, our last principle is to be considerate of other visitors. Um, after all, we are all visitors to these places and we get to return at the end of the day. And we want to make sure that the experience that we're having, we can extend to others so that they can have that kind of experience as well. In the workplace, um, we want to yield to other users on the trail. Uh, we work on a lot of horse trails, so if you encounter pack stock, I know this is common in the Grand Canyon as well, you want to remove your helmets and eye protection, avoid sudden movements to avoid scaring animals, which can throw the riders or put yourself in danger. And then when we're working as well, we want to make sure that we're taking our breaks away from trails and other visitors and trying to travel on durable surfaces to those areas as well. And also to keep our conversations um, quiet and professional around others so that they don't, so that other park visitors are having good wilderness experiences. Um, and then also let's let nature sounds prevail. For me, this is a huge pet peeve, but I really hate hearing someone blasting music on a Bluetooth speaker when hiking on a trail. Um, if you want to listen to music, I do that sometimes when I hike, just use earbuds or something like that. Um, but also using speakers, especially in wilderness areas, disturbs animals' natural cycles and, and can sort of be disruptive to communication, especially between birds. With that, I'm going to hand it off to PTAC, who's going to go over some of the COVID-19 procedures um, and leave no trace. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. So uh, the reason that, that we're all here today as well is to talk about how these principles apply to the current context. Uh, we're undergoing the largest scale global pandemic in uh, really any, any of our lifetimes and uh, a pretty massive disruption uh, to our norms. And uh, with that, a lot of people have been wondering uh, if they can go outside and, and recreate outdoors. Uh, and the simple answer to that is, is yes. Uh, outdoor recreation is an important facet of our lives and it's recommended by the CDC as well as um, a number of other uh, reliable uh, sources for health information. Um, getting outside is a, a strongly recommended way to uh, remain physically active and improve our overall health, uh, both physical and mental. And uh, in the current context, it's really important that while we are getting outside, we consider all of the guidelines uh, in order to minimize the risks uh, of our own health as well as the risks to uh, the health of those around us. And so there's a, a number of guidelines we're going to give, give you all uh, for getting outside responsibly during COVID time. So like I stated earlier, um, the Center for Outdoor Ethics, a lot of their guidelines are um, backed by research and data. When COVID started, 
when COVID first reached America's shores in March, uh, the center did a series of three surveys. And some of those key findings from those surveys was that the size of outdoor recreation groups, unsurprisingly, has dropped from 5.81 people to about 1.85, showing that people are trying to stay within their cohorts um, and minimize the number of people they're spending time with. And then this is another important one. Recreationists were unsupportive of opening their own communities to outdoor tourism without restriction. I remember reading a lot of literature saying that high um, outdoor destinations like Bishop um, and Moab and here in Zion, uh, local residents were worried that there would be a flood of folks coming in to sort of avoid the virus in their own communities, but also on these quote COVID vacations I've heard of. So when traveling, I think this suggests that we should be conscious of how communities feel before going to them um, and potentially bringing in a virus that they never asked for. And then this is an encouraging finding, but recreationists are basing their behavior on personal health motives and clear communication from trusted sources like the CDC and other public health institutions. So. At least among the survey participants, it seems that recreationists are trying to be responsible when traveling um, and staying within their own communities when recreating. So what can we do? Uh, the center has put out a lot of information um, in order to help people navigate uh, outdoor spaces in, in COVID times. So a few things that I want to bring up specifically that I think are really important to you consider uh, when we get outside. Um, the first is to travel smart and we want to be mindful of stopping places, uh, especially stopping at any closed air place. Uh, we want to minimize gas stops and do our best uh, to minimize those associated risks. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, we're following any protocols when going into closed air spaces, including uh, wearing a mask or face covering, carrying hand sanitizer with us uh, if they're after we've touched any common surfaces, uh, and just doing those general things in order to keep ourselves clean. Uh, if you're ever using public transportation during these times, it's a good idea to, again, uh, carry a mask and carry hand sanitizer, wear your mask while in those closed air spaces, and then use that hand sanitizer even before uh, if you're taking a sip of water and you have to remove your mask, you should sanitize your hands before touching your mask in order to prevent any contamination of the item that you're putting directly over, over your face. Um, and it's always important to consider those things uh, before we even go somewhere. We also want to consider less visited parks, trails, and other places. This includes uh, the physical place, uh, as well as the timing of our visit. Uh, consider traveling during uh, weekdays if possible so that you're avoiding the weekends and high use times. And consider, especially for shorter trips, shorter hikes, going very early in the morning or going in the evening uh, when you're avoiding the peak times of day when there will be use. We also want to keep it close to home. And this is a, a rule that we generally stick to with a rule of thumb. Um, and that's that if it takes more than one gas stop to get to where you're going, then it's probably too far. Uh, so for example, you know, I'll fill my car when I leave here. If I have to make more than one more stop on my way, then I'm probably going farther away than I should. Um, we also want to make sure that we are wearing a mask and passing thoughtfully in tight corridors, even while outdoors. Uh, masks are not just for closed air spaces. Uh, this includes boardwalks. Uh, if you're ever on a boardwalk and there are folks going in both directions, you want to make sure that you're wearing your mask because getting that six feet away and social distancing is not going to be an option. If you're on single track or uh, just a simple two track and you can't get six feet away from folks uh, who you're either passing or uh, who are traveling the other way, then you want to make sure that you're giving them space as much as possible. And in doing so, you're looking for durable surfaces in order to step off the trail. So uh, consider stepping off trail onto a rock or onto, again, grasses and things that will grow back seasonally and quickly and uh, repair themselves well. And uh, if, the, if the trail is crowded, 
you do want to make sure that you're you're wearing that mask all the time, not just when you're uh, when you're directly next to someone else. Um, and keep it handy so that you can put it on on trails. Uh, if you are on one that you know there may only be one or two other cars at the trailhead, it's a, it's pretty likely that you're going to see those people at some point. So even if you're not wearing it for the entire hike, it's a good idea to. Uh, keep it in your pocket or keep it nearby so you can easily put it on uh, whenever you are encountering those other people. It's also uh, extremely important that we pack what we need. Um, ensuring that you pack all your necessary gear and food minimizes the number of stops in public places and increases your safety while outdoors. So having all of the gear, not just for the activity that you're going outside to do, but also for any emergency situation that you think you, there may be risk of uh, finding yourself in so that you can deal with that emergency situation to the best of your ability, uh, again, without extra resource expenditure. And then with food, uh, we wanna make sure that we're uh, meal planning, meal prepping and packing all the food that we have. That way, if we are going somewhere more rural, we don't have to go into local businesses and local communities that are lower risk because we could then become a vector for disease for that community. So we wanna make sure that we're bringing all the food that we need with us so we don't have to get groceries or uh, go to a restaurant. And if you are going to a restaurant while traveling, most businesses have uh, developed really great curbside pickup and to go uh, options. So look into those before you uh, go and make that phone call and see if curbside delivery is an option again so that you don't become a vector of disease for that community in case uh, you were to be carrying COVID or, or really any other uh, airborne pathogens. Um, it's also important to, to bring a cooler and enough water for your entire trip and have a safe and secure place to store all of your food and water for the entirety of your trip. Um, this can mean uh, different things in different contexts. For example, the, the five gallon cubies would be great in a car camping situation. Uh, if you're on a backpacking trip, you know, you're always going to want to carry your water purifier anyway, uh, but just planning ahead and, and just being extra mindful of those things right now are especially important, again, to minimize the number of times that you have to go into public places. It's also important to pack it in and pack it out right now. Uh, carrying out trash is really important because it not only impacts the environment, uh, but certain objects like pop bottles and napkins can hold those pathogens and again become vectors for disease. And part of that is that we want to make sure that we're being uh, conscientious, conscientious of those who are working in the parks and working on public lands. Uh, within the National Park Service right now, they are not allowing roommates in most uh, employee housing facilities and not allowing roommates has significantly reduced the crew size. Our parks are extremely understaffed and it's very few people working very, very hard to keep our parks safe and clean um, during these times. So we want to make sure uh, that we're being considerate of them and packing out our own trash rather than maybe setting a trash bag next to an already full uh, trash can or, or things like that that a lot of folks do. Um, so we want to make sure that, that we're being considerate of their workload and also of their health. We also want to make sure that we plan all our accommodations beforehand and avoid staying in crowded campsites and areas or staying in small low-risk communities. While it may sound appealing to go somewhere that's low-risk, we need to be mindful that a lot of the areas that we live in and are going to be traveling through in order to get somewhere do have, uh, do have COVID uh, cases and that we may pick that up on our way and bring that into those small communities who don't have the resources to deal with a large scale outbreak. Again, all of these things really boil down to this first principle, which is plan ahead and prepare. It's extremely important to do right now in our current context. And if you follow a few simple guidelines with this, um, then you're going to be able to go do some really cool things still. Uh, so we can get outside. We just have to make sure uh, that we're doing so responsibly. Yeah, I think with that, I just want to add real quick that 
when we are recreating um, that we're avoiding taking obscene risks um, in our recreational activities. I think it's true of many outdoor hobbies that there is a certain inherent risk in things like rock climbing or mountain biking or skiing or other things that make those activities appealing, but maybe consider postponing your more ambitious objectives for a time later when the possibility of you getting hurt um, isn't going to add to the already overburdened healthcare system. But while we think about that, we want to open it up to questions. So if you have any questions about Leave No Trace um, or Leave No Trace in COVID or travel, um, you can type those into the chat box and we'll go ahead and answer them. We have a couple right now, so we can read those off and then respond to those. So. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. So the first question that came in uh, was, how can ACE interns and members attend the trainer workshop or master educator course? Is there a list of upcoming workshops and courses? Uh, so internally within ACE, we don't have anything on the schedule, uh, at least between Sam and myself for, for leading a trainer workshop. We would like to uh, do so once we can safely camp with others. Um, that said, the center does have a list of upcoming events and courses on their website. Uh, their website is linked in the uh, PDF document that was included in the chat earlier today. Uh, and you can also always just get on their website at lnt.org. Uh, they do courses regularly and nationwide, so uh, typically there are opportunities available for uh, interns, members, and staff. Uh, they've also updated some of their curr curriculums to, um, to be able to have these events uh, safely during COVID time. Uh, so some of those events, even right now, are still available. Um, our second uh, question. Do you mind if I add to that? Oh, quick? yeah, go ahead. Um, and if any of you are interested in becoming master educators, uh, that, those courses are held by affiliate programs and not by the center itself. Um, so if you're interested in those kinds of courses because you want to teach Leave No Trace and have a healthy appreciation for the outdoors, um, you can look at those. The, I think the most common provider is Knowles or the National Outdoor Leadership School, and they hold those all over the country. You can visit that on their website. And you can also, um, and in the Southeast near Asheville, Landmark Learning is a Knowles affiliate program that does outdoor education right outside of there. Um, and they also put on, uh, they also put on Leave No Trace Master Educator courses. Another question that's relevant just came up and it's, can you use your AmeriCorps Education Award for the Master Educator class? And that is a definitive yes. Um, that's what I did to get mine. <laughs> so it's definitely, I, I think it was definitely worth the expenditure. Um, I've gotten a lot of, out of it. And it was just a really fun course as well. Um, the next question is, when I recreated in high use hotspot areas, I found that a lot of visitors may not be intentionally doing some things that have a negative impact on our environment. Does LNT have any resources or talking point tips on engaging in the outdoors to teach LNT in a positive way that isn't threatening or aggressive? And the answer is yes. Um, we like to use the term, the authority of the resource um, when we're talking about um, confronting others. Um, and confront is the wrong word. Um, the way that you should approach people to talk about leave no trace when you see something or someone engaging in a behavior that could be considered destructive or maybe impactful. Um, we just wanna make them consider the resource that they're damaging. So instead of telling someone not to litter um, and then sort of attributing it to some sort of deficient morality on that person, saying like, we don't wanna damage this resource that we both traveled to, to see. Um, and because we both value this thing, we have a commonality there and it creates a connection between you and the person you're engaging with before, um, yeah, in, instead of creating a hostile interaction. Do yeah, another really important uh, thing to keep in mind with that is, is approaching those uh, situations as learning opportunities uh, for that person. So you can use the authority of the resource as an opportunity in order to explain to them the impacts. Um, a really easy example with this is feeding animals. Uh, people will uh, throw um, 
you know, their like peanuts to squirrels and whatever. And you can explain using stories like the rattlesnake and Bryce, uh, how that can directly impact wildlife and their health as well as uh, the, the health of, of visitors. Um, and another really good example there, uh, there's a huge, uh, a huge number of people who throw biological waste uh, on the trail, things like orange peels and banana peels and apple cores. Um, and a, a really simple way to, to get folks to stop doing that is to explain to them that uh, those products often contain compounds that are uh, that are toxic to animals. For example, citric acid is extremely toxic for bears and uh, many other wildlife species in, in North America. So we want to make sure uh, that we're deferring to some of the, the facts and the science so that people understand why uh, we are, um, you know, addressing that behavior and, and talking to them about it. And that, that goes a long way in, in changing that interaction from something negative into something positive. Not to mention banana peels are a tripping hazard and we don't want people sliding around <laughs> on our trail systems. Um, our next question is, are there jobs available with Leave No Trace to help engage others with learning the Leave No Trace principles and healthy land stewardship? Um, there are jobs available. I think the most common one they fly is the Leave No Trace is partnered with Subaru and it's the Leave No Trace Subaru Travel and Trainer Program. They try to hire a pair of individuals with a known working history to teach Leave No Trace. Um, there really isn't, there, are very, there aren't very many minimum requirements um, in terms of any training. So you don't necessarily need to be a Leave No Trace trainer or master educator to apply for those jobs. They're just looking for people who are enthusiastic. Um, it probably skews towards the younger dem demographic and folks who are adept. Um, on social media, since that job is about traveling to different parks and other areas and engaging with visitors to teach them about Leave No Trace. Um, most of Leave No Trace though is uh, sort of coordinated through a volunteer network. Um, for instance, master educators are listed on a roster that you can find on the Leave No Trace website. So if you're interested in, in becoming a master educator or holding these kinds of courses, um, you can get yourself listed on that website and then you can you are available to be contacted by folks in your area who might be interested in putting on their own awareness workshops for the community um, or learning about leave no trace themselves mm -hmm. yeah i think another really important thing to to consider with those uh, leave no trace um, opportunities yeah as, as sam mentioned is that a lot of those courses are put on by affiliated organizations and and we are an affiliated uh, organization, so um, you don't have to, to just scan the center's website um, to apply for jobs and um, do that kind of thing to get involved. You can take a, a course um, through a partner, um, or you can reach out to us. And, and like we mentioned earlier, we uh, really are hoping to, to do more education in the future. Um, and we'd love to get folks up to that, that trainer status so that they can uh, spread the principles and, and lead workshops um, for work and beyond. Yeah. And there are a lot of jobs that I think combine Leave No Trace training um, with other responsibilities. For example, on the Appalachian Trail, there are a lot of ridge runner positions where you're kind of a backcountry ranger on that trail. And one of the requirements for that job is some understanding or training in Leave No Trace. So, you're going out there hiking every day and picking up trash, but you're also um, informing visitors or trying to train them in Leave No Trace best practices while camping and just generally being a resource to those who might not have all of the training that you have. Um, which is a great segue to our next question, which is, I'm really interested in doing a through hike. Are there specific Leave No Trace resources for through hiking? I would say most um, trail association pages have best practice, um, best practices on their websites, for instance, the Pacific Crest Trail Association and, and the Appalachian Trail Club. I'm not so sure about the CDT or perhaps the Colorado Trail, but they have recommendations um, and they're, they're also partner organizations with Leave No Trace. Um, right now, the Appalachian Trail and the PCT are 
discouraging folks from through hiking just because um, someone who is through hiking often signs goes into a lot of small towns and communities and they don't want to encourage folks to be vectors of disease. Um, that said, there are still a lot of people out there on the trails backpacking. So if you are, try to limit it to a smaller section hike, um, minimizing the number of resupplies that you need to do. So consider caching equipment beforehand or doing an unsupported hike where you're carrying everything you need except for water. And that way you don't have to make any stops. I know myself personally, I'm planning on doing a couple of different backpacking trips this year and I've sort of limited them to small trips where I can carry all of the resources that I need on my back personally. Um, and I'm doing loop hikes where I don't have to hitchhike or, or do anything like that that would expose me or have myself expose my germs to another person. Mm -hmm. There's also, I think a, a really important thing with this is that uh, the center has put out a lot of information packet, packets that are specific to certain activities. Mm -hmm. And they do have those available for backpacking. They also have them uh, available for specific environments. They have a Alaska specific one. They have kayaking specific ones, uh, desert environment ones, uh, fishing ones, all kinds of stuff. So, so the center does have a lot of resources that they offer uh, for specific places and activities. And those are a really good, good place to uh, start that research. Uh, if you go through the, the PDF document that was shared or the Google doc that was shared, uh, there are a lot of resources available through that. Uh, and that website, they are constantly uh, putting out uh, new information and, and putting new stuff on their website. They're also extremely active on social media and through their Twitter and Instagram and, and other social media accounts, the center is uh, putting out daily COVID tips for how to get outdoors responsibly right now. Uh, so if it is something you're interested in, in learning more about, uh, I would definitely encourage you to, to start uh, that research through their website because it's a, a great place to, uh, yeah, to start mm -hmm. learning. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of um, outdoor advocacy groups, um, well, I only know of two for rock climbing, like this, um, the Access Fund and the American Alpine Club have been giving guidance to rock climbers on different activities to do, or like how to climb safely without putting yourself at too much risk or risking others. Um, and I'm sure other advocacy groups um, are doing similar things for mm -hmm. other outdoor hobbyists. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions, but uh, in that, that document, again, uh, we do have our, our email addresses listed. So if anyone has uh, any more questions and would like to, to contact Sam or I directly, uh, you have our emails and uh, we're always more than happy to uh, to talk about leave no trace and and to offer what advice we can or just simply uh, you know talk about these things uh, whenever we don't have answers because a lot of it is uh, yeah yeah fluid and flexible especially in the current context and um, so yeah thank you to everyone uh, for for joining our call and I'm really glad we were able to, to do this and I hope you got something out of it. And uh, if you're looking for more, there's definitely some resources available. Just, just follow the links in that document, which will also be posted to the ACE library um, or go straight to the lnt.org website. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again for everyone who showed up.